Welcome to Inquiring Minds. My name is Doug and I'm back with another Pen Resurrection Sunday video. Today's fountain pen back from the dead is this 1950 Parker 21 Aerometric. The what? Yeah, I hadn't heard of the Parker 21 before either. When there is anything I don't know about Parker pens, which is most of the time, I immediately go to Tony Frashier's marvelous encyclopedia of everything Parker website, parkerpens.net. I'll link his pages in the description below. If you're interested in vintage Parker fountain pens from the company's inception in the year of the gunfight at OK Corral, 1888, to today's modern Parker pen company, Tony's website has information on every model Parker ever made, and even some they had thought of and developed, but never brought to market. I'll let you know some of the history of the inexpensive little brother of the famous Parker 51, and show you how I got it back to working condition again, right now. So what I have here is a Parker 21 Generation 1 or Mark 1, and it has a gold filled cap. It's got a green plastic body and green plastic section. This is an aerometric filler. I've had this pen apart. I've taken the nib out and it's taken me quite a while to get that all realigned. So I might take the hood off for you to show you, but I'm not going to take that nib out again because that took me hours to get it back realigned. I've got another uh, Parker 21 uh, and this has a chrome cap or a Lusterloy cap. I was trying to do the same thing with this one, get the nib out and so forth and I struggled with it so much that the hood cracked. One of the things about these 21s, the plastic was very brittle and finding them in original condition without any cracks in them is rare. I was trying to get this aerometric sleeve off of here, but it's glued on there pretty tight. So I was unscrewing the hood and trying to align and see how tight it is. So that hood cracked, so that's no good anymore. I was trying to adjust this steel nib. This is what the nib looks like. The ebonite feed and the nib fit down inside this sleeve uh, unit. And there's the clutch ring. The clutch ring is actually in two parts. Get this apart here, there we go. It's in two rings that fit together. And I got this nib out of there but getting it back in again because this this section piece is all misshapen and i guess someone else tried to get this off with some heat as well and really distorted that so those threads ended up being distorted and when i tried to get the hood back on i was putting it on and off and on and off to try to get that nib aligned with the hood and it cracked on me right down the center. You can't even see that crack until you open it up. It starts to open up. There you go. So that's now a parts pen. So I'm going to polish up the barrel and the hood. I'm going to clean up that nib so that it uh, shines a little bit more. And I'm going to polish up that gold filled cap. And we'll get this back into pristine condition and we'll, it has some scratches and marks on it here. And uh, we'll get it writing for your pen resurrection edification. sack's in pretty good condition. Uh, I do have a replacement sack for it, but uh, there's nothing wrong with this one. Slightly discolored, but it's intact. The breather tube inside there is in good condition. So I'm not going to take this apart. I'm going to polish up that ebonite feed and the nib, and I'm going to run this through my ultrasonic for a while first. And while that nib section and 
sack are in the ultrasonic bath. We'll get at this barrel and section with some Meguiar's Swirl Remover number two. This is a very fine grit polishing compound. Works great on plastic. Polish it up with a microfiber cloth. And there you can see, looks very, very good. There's still some micro abrasions in there, so I'll give it another coat and try to get some of those cap scratches out. They're very, very faint. <laughs> there we are, looking very, very good indeed. Now we'll do the hood. And there's the hood, looking like it's brand new. The sack protector uh, aerometric squeeze cover is absolutely pristine. It's in really good shape, doesn't need to have anything done to it. And the cap is in super shape, there are a couple of, so that is looking very, very nice indeed. Now, this might be the last time you get to see this nib. So it does say Parker, Octanium, USA, and 50. And I'm not sure that that 50 is a date code, but uh, it certainly lines up with the uh, Mark I version of the Parker 21 at 1950. So I'm going to call it 1950. Now that I've put that polish on there, I'm going to put this once more into the ultrasonic bath to get any of that extraneous polish out of there so it doesn't interfere the, with the flow of the ink. My uh, ultrasonic bath is of pen flush and I make my own pen flush and that is uh, nine parts distilled water and one part ammonia. Now it's all polished up and dried. I'm going to put the sack protector on, our metric filler. Now, I think this was glued on before, but because of how incredibly glued that one was, I'm just going to leave this one the way it is because it actually fits very snug on there and it takes some effort to get it off without gluing it. I'm going to put some silicone grease on those threads. Silicone oil, actually, not grease. This is more for lubrication than it is for keeping ink from seeping out. And we don't want to get silicone oil or grease anywhere near the feed, as that will definitely block the flow. So we'll put this on the pen. Whoops. Got to first put the sleeve on, the clutch ring. The old acronym I used to tell my students in, in theater school was when you were soldering a plug, you made sure you put the sleeve on first and then soldered the plug. Otherwise, you'd have to cut it off and start all over again. Once you soldered the plug and then tried to put the sleeve on and it wasn't, wasn't there to begin with. I had an acronym for that. It was called PTGDSOF or put the goddamn sleeve on first. I'd already lined that up so that it was perfect before and it still is perfect. Now I can put the barrel on and the cap and we should be complete and ready to ink the pen. So the pen tells you to squeeze it three times and fill it with super chrome. We're going to use Waterman and we will put it in the ink. One, two, three. A couple of extra times just for luck. Just until you don't hear any more bubbles. And you wipe with a soft cloth. You can see that's fairly full. So we're going to call this a 1950 Parker 21. And here is the 1950 Parker 21 after restoration. I'll talk about the parts and features, show some size comparisons and measurements, and then do a writing sample. But first, 
a little history about this particular model of fountain pen. No, God, please, no, no! I'll be leaning heavily on Tony Frischier for his history. The Parker 21 model was introduced in 1948. This is the same year Parker discontinued the vacuumatic version of the Parker 51, replacing the vacuumatic filler with the aerometric filler. It is also the year they discontinued the venerable Parker vacuumatic. Both of those decisions are regrettable, in my opinion. I love the vacuumatic filling system and dislike the aerometric. But time and innovation marches on and Parker continued to evolve. The Parker 51 was Parker's flagship fountain pen since 1941 and was wildly popular and Parker continued making them until 1972, producing over 50 million of them in 31 years of production. When Parker upgraded the 51 with the new aerometric filling system, the pen was also relatively expensive, selling for $12.50 in 1941 or $255.82 in today's dollars. In 1948, the Parker 21 was introduced to serve the entry-level fountain pen market like students and young professionals. It was priced at just $5, or $62.41 in today's dollars, and although visually similar to the famous Parker 51, is not made of the same quality materials as the 51 and doesn't incorporate the 51's more modern, for 1948, nib and feed technology. The 21 has a metal, not gold nib, that Parker called octanium because it was an alloy comprised of eight different metals. And the 21's nib doesn't have the same tubular shape, and the feed is more conventional than the 51's ink collector. The 21's plastic section and barrel were made of cheaper plastic and had a differently shaped clip, but sported the newfangled aerometric filler with a modern transparent plastic ink sac, which Parker called plyglass instead of the latex sac of the vacuumatic. This meant that the sac could literally last forever, and they seemed to do just that, as this one is still in great shape after 73 years. The Parker 21 version 1, or Mark 1, had some flaws. The nib dried out when left uncapped and tended to blob when writing and would spit ink into the cap. So Parker revised the design of the Mark II in 1952 to incorporate the ink filler into the section as a unit and the nib and feed were much closer to the hooded section. Overall, the Parker 21 is slightly shorter than the aerometric Parker 51 capped, posted, and unposted. This is a 1954 Parker 51 aerometric in burgundy with a 12 karat gold filled cap. From the top we see a gold filled finial rather than the inlaid jewel typical of the Parker 51. The clip is a sleek non-feathered design that is very springy and usable. The cap tapers up and is flush with the barrel. The front of the cap has Parker and the back has made in can one tenth 10k gold filled engraved on it. I assume that means made in Canada, but the extra three letters probably cut into the profit margins on the pen too much. It could mean that it's made in Cancun, but I doubt it. The green plastic barrel is straight to here where it tapers down to a rounded end which has a ventilation hole in it to equalize the pressure when screwing the barrel back on after filling. The cap slips off with a similar but smoother clutch design than the 51 to reveal the long tapering section that resembles the Parker 51 section but is completely different in function. And you can see how the section hole is larger than the nib and feed and there's quite a bit of space between the nib and that hood. There is a plastic liner on the inside of the cap to seal the nib. The barrel unscrews to reveal the aerometric squeeze filler. The metal sack protector and squeeze bar unit feels like stainless steel but might be some kind of light alloy and is engraved with Parker 21 to fill press ribbed bar three times, wipe front end, pen point down with soft tissue, use super chrome ink. The Parker Pen Company, Janesville, Wisconsin, USA. Amazing they can engrave all those instructions including an advertisement for the Parker Super Corrosive Ink but couldn't afford to engrave the rest of Canada on the back of the cap. 
Of course, the internal parts came from the United States, but were assembled in Toronto. Here's a comparison of the difference between the Parker 51 and the Parker 21 aerometric fillers. The 51 is much more substantial. The cap posts deeply and securely, and the pen is as beautifully balanced in the hand as the Parker 51. Unposted, the pen is plenty long enough to write with comfortably. Now let's look at some size comparisons. Here is the 1950 Parker 21 with a 1954 Parker 51, a mid-1960s Parker 45 in dove gray with a gold-filled cap, a mid-60s Parker 17 made in France, and a circa 1990 Parker 88 Place Vendome made in the UK, which still has the pen tag. Now let's look at them posted. And here they are posted. The Parker 45 posts beautifully. I think it's one of the best posting pens in the world. And you can see the refinement of the design up to the Parker 45. Later in the 80s and the 90s, pens got very, very slim and pencil-like. And this Parker nib is 22 karat plated, not a gold nib. The 17 is steel, 14 karat gold on the 45 and on the 51, and of course octanium on the 21. Now let's look at them unposted. And here they are unposted. Again, the 45 is the longest of the group unposted, but the shortest of the group posted. Very interesting pen. Now let's look at some measurements, and I'll be back with a writing sample. And we're back with the writing portion of the review. This is Claire Fontaine 90 GSM paper, and this is a 1950 Parker 21, and it has a fine octanium, octanium nib. Let's check the wetness. Well, this is very, very, very wet. Beautiful, gushy pen. I haven't experienced any of the blobbing that uh, supposedly is indicative of a Parker 21, Mark 1. I should put this in, that this is a Mark 1 version of this pen. And the nib is very smooth with a good amount of feedback. That's the line variation. Well, not very much is apparent and none was expected. And the ink today is, of course, Waterman's Serenity Blue. And the line this nib makes is 0 0.5 millimeters, which makes it a Western fine or a Japanese fine to medium on my Richard Binder line width chart, which you can find linked in the description below. And for our quote. And for some reverse writing. Much thinner and much scratchier and much drier, but it does it. And for some quick writing. No issues whatsoever, very wet pen. So what are my thoughts on this resurrection? Well, it was fun to discover the Parker 21. The design of the 21 is like a sheep in wolf's clothing. It's like Parker asked a committee to examine the Parker 51 and make a conventional fountain pen with a normal nib and feed, but make it look like the Parker 51. It's like they crammed an ordinary steel fountain pen nib and feed into a shell that resembles the Parker 51. And they succeeded to a point. The pen was sold for about 60% less than the price of a Parker 51. And once they solved the issues with the first version with the Mark II, they had a relatively popular entry-level pen that appealed to those who couldn't afford the flagship Parker 51 offering. I remember when I wanted to buy my first car. I wanted a 1977 Firebird Esprit in white with a racing stripe, 
but I couldn't afford it. I looked at getting a 1977 Pontiac Sunbird instead. It was just a Chevy Vega in Firebird clothing, a gutless car in Wolf's clothing. I bought a 77 Toyota Celica instead. It was a great car. You could fix it with a Phillips screwdriver and a pair of vice grips. So I broke one Parker 21 while I was doing this restoration and I restored the other. That's a 50% success rate, I'd say. And this is now an excellent writer and very attractive pen. Fully restored and working, if it were a 1950 Parker 51 with a gold-filled cap and gold nib, it'd be worth around $150 to $175 US. As it is, a fully restored and working 1950 Parker 21 with a gold-filled cap and steel nib, I'll sell it for $35 US plus shipping. If you're interested in this fountain pen, just contact me at inkquiringminds at gmail.com and let me know. And there you have it. If you like this video, please like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that bell to get instant notifications whenever a new video is posted. You can also join as a member of my channel for only 99 cents a month, and I guarantee I'll answer your comments in the comment section, and you'll get cool emojis, badges, and sneak peek unboxing videos as well. And that just leaves it for me to say, thank you. For watching. And that's all she wrote.